Oh, hey there, guys. Uh, so I lied. This uh, this isn't actually a Bergman video. This is uh, well, I've been playing a lot of chess recently, and well, I've been getting really good, and uh, I, I didn't know how else to get people to watch me play chess. Well, yeah, we're here now, so I'm just gonna play a few games, show you guys how good I've gotten. So as you can see here, I'm on LieChess.org, my favorite website. And uh, we're just going to play some Blitz, see how it goes. Hopefully we don't get any Grandmasters or anybody too good. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. So I'm just going to do five minutes. Okay, finally. Nice, we got an opponent. Uh, let's see who we're playing. Uh, looks like his name is... Jag är döden. Kommer du för att hämta mig? Jag har redan länge gått vid din sida. Hello to all my beautiful subscribers. I'm glad you could make it for this video. So what is this video, really? Well, recently in the uh, in one of the flash sales for Criterion, I decided to bite the bullet and I bought the highly prized Ingmar Bergman's cinema. This is the coolest item I have ever had in my possession and I was ecstatic when it came in. This is the coolest box set there has ever been. And it's going to be hard to top it. Maybe if Criterion ever came out with a uh, Kurosawa one, a uh, Blu-ray Kurosawa collection, that could be a contender. But for now, this is the greatest item in film collectors history in my opinion. This collection comes with 39 Ingmar Bergman films and I watched all of them in the span of about two months and now I want to put my thoughts on display and rank them 39 to 1 from worst to best. So that is what I'm gonna do and I hope you enjoy. Just to note there will be Minor spoilers, but if you haven't seen them, I don't think it should be that big of a deal. Um, if you're very sensitive about stuff like that, then definitely, then maybe hold off or skip certain ones. But I don't think what I say really affects your viewing experience, so it should be fine. Uh, but that's up to your discretion. Oh yeah, and also, if you're wondering why my shirt changes so many times throughout this video, it's because I recorded this across multiple days, so I'm not just like being weird and changing my shirt, but yeah, whatever, you, you probably don't care, but I just thought I would uh, make that clear. <laughs> so yeah, uh, hope you enjoy. Here's number 39. I don't know what to do if I haven't got you. Let's go. All right, coming in last place at 39, I have to go with 1971's The Touch. And some may find this placement unfair. And I understand completely. In some ways, I find it unfair myself. Because, and the reason for that is that I think this film suffers from its placement in Bergman's filmography. To demonstrate what I mean, let's just run through uh, the sequence of films that come before and directly after The Touch. Okay. It goes... Shame, The Passion of Anna, The Touch, Cries and Whispers, 
and then scenes from a marriage. I guess the right is also in there. I kind of forgot about that one, but uh, let's just forget about that for now. If you see the rest of the list that we're about to unfold, you'll realize why this created such a discrepancy for me. Uh, the quality between these films and the touch in my eyes is perhaps the biggest gap in all of Bergman's films. And the reasons why I don't like this film are the following. So for one, the switch from Swedish to English. And while this is no... Obviously Bergman can do what he wants, right? I'm not saying... You're not allowed to speak. You're not allowed to speak English. You got to speak your your native tongue. Like he can make whatever film he wants, but the switch was a bit um, jarring, to say the least. And I don't think the screenplay is anywhere near as compelling as some of his Swedish ones, or any of his Swedish ones for that matter. A lot of lines come off cliche. A lot of lines come off awkward. The dialogue is not nearly as good as his better Swedish films. And I feel bad in saying it, but that's just the truth for me. Another reason, uh, Elliot Gold, I personally don't think he did a good job. And I have no problem with Elliot Gold. I, I mean, I've seen him in Friends. I've seen him in... The Long Goodbye, he has his place in film history. Uh, not that he's like some idol, but he's good, right? He's a fine actor, but in this film, I don't think he did a very good job. It feels, he feels out of place. And yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. Another thing, the themes, the iconography, Bergman has made countless films with these topics. Adultery, marriage, there are even subtle notes of war and, you know, all the things that come with it. I think this is one film where I have to say these ideas felt underdeveloped and almost a bit shallow. He's done, and as I said, he's done countless films with these topics already. It feels a bit like a rehashing and not a good one. But in saying that, with those 25 years of experience that he had making films before this, I mean, nobody can say this is a poorly made film. It's paced well. It's a, I mean, there's Sven Nyquist on uh, cinematography. It looks good. But when you dig into the soul of the film, not the technical aspects, the soul of this film, I think it falls flat. And for those reasons, The Touch is my least favorite Bergman film. So yes, number 38 is going to be The Serpent's Egg, Bergman's only other English language film, at least in the collection. Um, and guys, I wanted to like this film, genuinely. I saw the setting, uh, and it looked very interesting to me. You know, it's set in 1920s Berlin. It's got kind of this very grainy, underground feeling to it. You know, like a criminal underground, not like physically underground. And it started off great, too. Uh, that clip that I just showed, that was like, that's like the very first scene. And it was, it was honestly a very, it was very good scene. Credits even had this very ominous tone to it where there was like interlacing scenes of like people walking and um, the credits, it was like kind of a montage and it kind of reminded me of the step scene in Nostalgia uh, from Tarkovsky if you know that film. This film fell flat very quickly. It feels very much like a noir, like a very pulpy noir-esque film with this very kind of meandering narrative that kind of just goes until it drops, you know what I mean? The main character played by David Carradine, who uh, played Bill in Kill Bill, which was kind of funny, um, 
he kind of walks towards this finale that to me was just completely ridiculous. It felt like it was trying to go for something, but it feels kind of like an afterthought. I don't think the film has the artistic backbone to support what he did with this film. I don't think it worked very well at all. And honestly, the more I think about it, the more I think it's actually his worst film. And I'm just gonna say, genuinely, I do think this is worse than The Touch by quite a bit. And this is the only time I'll do this, but pretend The Serpent's Egg is last because there's no doubt it's worse than The Touch. There's no doubt. This movie is ridiculous. This movie is such a forgettable one-off. Like, there's no point to it. Yeah, that's The Serpent's Egg. All right, and number 37 is going to be a sh uh, 1947's A Ship to India. This is one of Bergman's earliest films, uh, just a year after his debut, Crisis. And yes, you can tell he's still in those very early stages of filmmaking where he doesn't really have all the knowledge, all the tools necessary to make his later masterpieces. It's a story that revolves around the relationship, a very strained and tension-filled relationship between the, a father and son who both work on this uh, kind of barge thing where they like collect, they like collect metal or something. I don't know. They work together on this boat, and there it's a very strange relationship that eventually that eventually comes to a head. Uh, I won't spoil it, but it, it's it comes to a head, and and events transpire. And then on the other hand, there's also this kind of very strange love triangle between the son, his dad, and his dad's mistress. <laughs> so yeah, they're both kind of vying for the love of his dad's mistress. It's kind of funny to me. That's not really the point of the film. It's a very sloppy, sloppily made film. I mean, just for an example, this one, there's this one scene in the theater uh, early on with the father, and he kind of gets into like a bar fight kind of scenario. And genuinely, it is, I, I literally laughed out loud. It was the, like, one of the funniest fight scenes I've ever seen. If I can find it, I'll put it here. It is so... It is so ridiculously badly choreographed. It is crazy. But that's just one example. It's it's very awkward and the and the plot itself is somewhat melodramatic. Um and doesn't really dig into much. The reason I would rather watch this than The Serpent's Egg or The Touch, though, is that it has this sort of charm uh of being such an early film that you kind of appreciate it for it's time. Whereas those other films are seen as more of a disappointment, where this is seen as more of a predecessor to greatness. Overall, as a film, I probably, this is probably never one that I'll return to. I mean, I'm never going to look at my, I'm never going to look at my collection and say, yeah, I want to watch the 37th best Bergman film. I mean, no, it's, it's just a below average drama. That's all I can say. Uh, coming in at 36 is Bergman's directorial debut, Crisis. And for it being his first film, it's not as bad as... It's not, 
terrible. It's not great, though. I do kind of have this rose-colored perspective on it, though, for the fact that it was his first film. It does have that kind of um, weight. Knowing that it was his first film, it's like, it was very exciting for me. Uh, watching Crisis, when I put it in, it was like, oh my god, it was like the start of a journey. You know what I mean? It was very fun. So I do like it for that reason. But the film itself is not, not anything special, let's be honest. Acting in this was subpar, I have to say. And I don't say that often. I genuinely don't say, I don't make that critique often, but... Jack, especially, um, who was played by Stieg Olin, who actually went on to do some pretty good stuff in To Joy, Summer Interlude, Port of Call, for Bergman later on. But in this film, I feel like he was overacting just a bit. <laughs> but that's a small issue. The main narrative, I suppose it does have some draw to it. One thing about it, there's kind of this small town big city connection that I feel to the film as I'm from a relatively small town and so I can kind of relate with some of the themes here. What I'm talking about is basically Nellie, the main the main girl, um, she kind of lives this, you know, comfortable but boring life with her mother when her birth mother so that was her adoptive mother. But her birth mother comes in from the big city. She hasn't seen her in years. She's like kind of rich, I guess. She owns like a beauty salon. And she's got this bad boy son named Jack. Her and Jack come together to the small town where Nellie lives. And she's like, oh, come live with me. She's like, oh, the big city seems so great. And then she goes there and it ends up not being all that all that she thought it was. So it's kind of like a moral lesson in that sense. And some people may not agree with that sentiment that uh, you know a small small town is better than a big city. I mean, it's kind of a one-sided opinion, but that's what he was going for, and that's kind of what I get from the movie. But yeah. Living in a small town myself, there are draws to a big city. So yeah, I do get some of the stuff he's talking about here, but its execution is very um, bare bones. It's not as well crafted as you know some of his later films. Obviously, it's his first film. It's a it's an attempt. You know, he's getting his foot in the door, getting out there. It's nothing special. It's forgettable, and Nobody's watching this unless they're watching this box set, let's be honest. Uh, or they're just very interested in Bergman himself. Because this film really has no purpose outside of the context of Ingmar Bergman himself. So yeah, that's what I think of Crisis. And moving on. Alright, number 35 is going to be All These Women, 1964. The film directly before Persona, which is kind of crazy to think about. This is a, like, one of those quick 80-minute films. Super, It's pretty entertaining throughout the whole thing. It's very fun. You can breeze through it. It's got a great cast. I mean, B.B. Anderson, Harriet Anderson, Ava Dalbeck. Uh, Gertrude Fried, Alan Edval, and Jarl Kuhl, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it is at the end of the day. Oh, whoa, don't do that. It is at the end of the day a comedy through and through. It is trying to be a comedy. It's not going for anything deep, and that's okay. But it does mean it's not going to be very highly ranked on this list. Very fun. And it draws heavily from French New Wave influence, I noticed. There's a lot of uh, fourth wall stuff, some over-the-top choreography stuff, and different editing techniques. For example, there's a, there's a sex scene 
and they censor it by doing this little like dance thing and that is so that is so french like tell me that's not like a french thing like um and there's many other instances there's also a fair bit of slapstick comedy which i thought was very off brand for ingmar bergman um if there's one thing i can say about bergman it is he is he's is not funny he is really not that funny he has had some good jokes but for the most part he is not the best at comedy and that's just me being perfectly honest with one of my uh in regards to one of my favorite filmmakers another thing to note is this was bergman's first color film and it does use color it is very colorful <laughs> that one that one fireworks scene where uh cornelius is carrying the box of uh fireworks through the mansion was quite a spectacle which i enjoyed quite a bit this is a film i wouldn't say i don't like it i think it's i think its reputation is worse than it is just because it's so it's so not bergman's typical style but it i do think it has lots of charm i think most people would enjoy this movie honestly though it doesn't really say much so yeah all these women 1964 a fine film And number 34, A Lesson in Love. This is a bit of an earlier work starring two of my favorites uh, from the Bergman canon, uh, Gunnar Bjornstrand and Eva Dalbeck. The script itself is probably Bergman's funniest, and that's not saying much. I mean, I'm not like, it's not like side splitting humor, but there were some, uh, there were some moments that were quite funny to me. And I do get that there is kind of a disconnect between the 50s, the humor of the 50s, and the humor now. But to me, it's just, you know, it's not as funny as maybe it was back then. You know, one thing that was very funny, though, this separated David and Marianne are sitting together on the train. And then there's a guy across from them. And then David and the guy go outside and the guy's like... I bet you 10 bucks I can get a kiss from that girl in there. And he's like, and then David's like, oh yeah, sure, bro. <laughs> Do it. And um, and then he tries and he gets slapped and it's funny. And then he, and then David's like, okay, watch this, double it. And he's like, and then he goes and kisses her because she's his wife, obviously. And she's kind of in on it. And it's, it's, that, I honestly, that was probably the best gag in all of Bergman's filmography. Uh, I thought it was quite humor. I did think it was quite funny. The story is about an affair, essentially, very common for Bergman. Um, he's a gynecologist um, and he's got this relationship with one of his patients, but he's married and it kind of does this it has kind of an interesting way of storytelling, flashback, uh, narrative style. And there were some tender moments, I will say, um, especially with his daughter. And the kind of climax of this film is this uh, very long scene in the wedding hall. And it was definitely the highlight of the film. Yeah, A Lesson in Love. Good movie. Now, Thirst at number 33, I feel like Thirst is one of Bergman's more delicate, very early works. It has a lot of guts. It has a quite a bite to it. It's a very depressing film at times. There are talks of suicide, uh, attempted murders, psychiatric, hospitals, manipulation. It is a very bleak film at times. 
Uh, I guess that's really all I have to say about thirst, and let's move on. Mina damer och herrar, jag beklagar, men vi måste nu helt kort tala om helvetet. Helvetet är som en strut. Number 32, The Devil's Eye. This is a very playful film. Um, it's a very fun film. Not, I don't want to say lighthearted, because there is dark themes at work here concerning heaven and hell. But on the surface, it is a very playful film. The basic premise of the film is uh, the devil has a sty in his eye because there's like some, there's one pure virgin girl on earth or something like that. And that upsets the devil, right? So he sends Don Juan, who, if you don't know, is kind of like a folk legend where he's like a master seduce, seducer, who is played by uh, Jarl Kuhl, once again, who is in um, who is in All These Women. He's in Fanny and Alexander. And if you know his other work, you'll know why this role was perfect for him. I don't think anybody else could have played this role. He does, he does that, this pompous, over-the-top, attitude very well uh and it's it's very it's quite funny the movie itself while yeah i do have some i do have some complaints about it i mean it's not it's nowhere near i mean it's nowhere near obviously the upper echelons of his filmography but right away i was interested in the premise itself it felt very creative very fresh um even if it's not as, you know, emotionally stimulating as, you know, some other things. It feels very much like a fable. It is still a very fun watch. What an opening scene that was from Port of Call. And this is a very interesting film, I think. It revolves around the very sad life of this young girl living in this working class town. And you'll notice right away, the port part of the title is very important. The imagery is very strong, uh, that wanting to sail away, um, and also that very hard working life that is found in this type of town. As you saw, the movie opens with the main character attempting suicide in the river, or in the ocean, rather. And this inadvertently starts a relationship with one of her, one of the witnesses of this incident. Uh, she eventually gets pregnant and we, throughout the film, we learn about her past, though this film is marked with several instances of high melodrama. It's very dramatic, but there is still something very enthralling about this character and her struggles. And while most of the film is incredibly depressing, it ends on a hopeful note. Whether this note is naive or not, I guess that's up to you, but I think there's a lot going for Port of Call. It's one of his best pre-50s films, and I have to say I do really enjoy this one. News cutter six. All right, next up, Waiting Women from 1952. And I think this is a very interesting film for a lot of reasons. For one, it's... The way it tells its story is very cool to me. It's kind of a episodic film, in a way. Essentially, the movie splits itself up into sections. So there's about four or five women waiting 
uh, at this summer home type of deal, this vacation home, as they tell each other stories. And these stories all make up the episodes of the movie. And I thought that was a really cool, unique idea. And I don't see that, we don't see that a lot. We are, I can't really think of many examples that use this sort of format. I know there was that, that movie from the Coen brothers, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, that did this. Some people have mixed opinions on that movie. I thought it was pretty good. Um, but it's very similar to that in that it's like these short films, these short episodes split up to make a whole movie. Though in this one, the stories were more connected intimately rather than just connected through setting. Um, but enough about Coen Brothers. This is about waiting women. Um, but yeah, the the movie itself, even though the format did interest me, it didn't really click with me until the final scene, which is the longest one by far. It's about half an hour, 40 minutes or so. And it's the one I just showed in the elevator uh, between Gunnar Bjornstrand's character and Eva Dalbeck's, two of my favorites, as I've said before. Uh, and their exchanges are very personal, very revealing about their characters. It's one of those scenes that just captivates you, even though not much is really happening. To say you should watch a movie for one scene, I mean, to most is probably ridiculous, but I think it's a worthwhile watch. The other episodes, while not nearly as good in my opinion, are still entertaining enough to make it to that final scene. But no, this is not an essential Bergman film, but an interesting one nonetheless. So yeah, that's my thoughts on Waiting Women. Vi är då alla som löv här på marken. Stormen den rut, men jag blir aldrig trött. Now, Fora Document 1979. This is a direct follow-up to previous to the previous Fora document from 1970. It's a lot longer, about mm, an almost an hour longer, I'd say. And it sounds bad to say that it's boring, but the content that this film studies is very mundane, very routine. It's simply simple lives, and I don't say that with any connotation, but the simple lives of this farming community on display with no real, no real flourish to it, just life as it is and of course there's something beautiful to that but it does make for a bit of a slog if you will i did really enjoy the connection that we find between the two so as it is a direct follow-up it contains a lot of the same characters that we found before and kind of an update on their lives 10 years later which i think is really cool one of the best scenes of the film was interviewing the kids from the bus scene in the first one how they were all like no i want to leave for i want to leave for most of them said they want to leave right and then you find that a lot of them stayed in 10 years later and they're like oh i couldn't find a job stuff like that i don't know some people might consider that sad but some people might consider that a triumph um so I think there's a lot of beauty to be found in this movie. It's definitely not for the squeamish. There's a, <laughs> I'll just, I mean, it's not, you can't really spoil a documentary, but um, there's this one scene where they, they show in very detailed, a very detailed account of them slaughtering a pig. And the unceremonious way that they kill this pig is very uncomfortable especially for those who aren't used to that type of thing. And this isn't a movie. This is a documentary. This is a real pig. And it's, 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 it's very hard to watch, at least for me. I was like, ooh, but 
but it is necessary. It is a necessary part of their lives, and of course, I think it's, I of course I think it's good to add it in. Nothing wrong with that, but very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. But sometimes that's a good thing. So yeah, uh, for a document, 1979, lots of good to be found, but don't expect to be on the edge of your seat with this one. <laughs> but still, very beautiful film. Avstånd och leda. Avstånd och ängslighet. Avstånd och en skarp smak av järn på tungan. Jag vill att hon ska gå. Hennes letande efter det borttappade armbandet är så uppenbart en förevägning. All right, after the rehearsal. This one, this is a deceptively simple film. It's very short at only about 80 minutes, I'd say. But there's so much, there's so much packed into this thing. It's so dense with characters, their relationships. And then also this um, ex- exterior influence of all of Bergman's cinema. It feels very much like a late career film in that there's this trifecta of legends at play here. Uh, very late career Bergman, Ingrid Thulin, and Erland Josephson, legends of Swedish cinema, coming together for not their last, but very close, very late career performance. And they really, I think everybody in this film, there's only about five people in the cast, but really well acted film. It's also very interesting, the narrative style that he chose. This is pretty typical for, you know, late career uh, directors to kind of play with the form a little bit. I mean, Bergman was known to do this plenty of times in the past, but... Um, this was one of his most interesting ones to me because I feel like it's very much a hybrid of theater and film, which we know, which I know Bergman was almost as much a theater director as he was a film director, which was super surprising for me to learn. I feel like this marries the two mediums in such a cohesive, seamless way that it just really impressed me. Even though it's a very quick film, there's still so much to love about this. Um, yeah, I, it's really great, really cool film. So yeah, that's after the rehearsal. This is absolutely clear enough to spring now, but this is unmentioned and a mid-mentioned to play. So this next one is from the life of the marionettes and I have to preface this by saying I feel like I didn't give this film a fair shot on my first viewing. I still got a lot out of this film. I do think this film has a lot going for it but the reason why I say I was it was I didn't really give it a fair shot is because you see when I was watching these movies I was watching them in chronological order okay. And I really wanted to see Fanny and Alexander, okay? Because I've heard so many great things about it. So I was really trying to get through this one and get to Fanny and Alexander. And I feel like I maybe rushed rushed it a bit. And I didn't really fully take it in. I will talk about the things that I enjoyed and didn't. So for one, it is pretty cool that he did kind of a continuation of Scenes from a Marriage here, or I guess you could call it like a spin-off. It seems that Bergman was very attached to Scenes from a Marriage, seeing as he did two kind of spin-off films of it, which I find kind of interesting. I wonder why he felt so so attached to that one in particular. I'd be interested to look into that, see if there's any truth to that. Um, because yeah so this is this this is a continuation of um the eggermans i believe yeah so if you've seen scenes from a marriage it's the couple in the first episode 
um, who are always bickering, or more than bickering, they're very hostile to each other, and it's kind of like a catalyst for uh, Marianne and, um, I'm blanking, the other guy from Scenes from a Marriage, Erlen Josephson, um, for their kind of marital troubles themselves. So yeah, um, it's not B.B. Anderson, though, which I immediately noticed. I was like, I don't want to be like, like, it's not like it's like a prized role. Like, uh, it's like B.B. Anderson's best role or anything. But it's like, once you've seen her in, in that role, it was, took some getting used to, you know, I was like, you could never be Katarina. <laughs> like, I did have that little voice in the back of my head saying that, but... I got over that pretty quickly, but it is something to, it is something, you know, it's like when, um, back in the day when, uh, Aunt, Aunt, v, Aunt, what's her name from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, when, uh, the mom, Aunt, Aunt V, Aunt Viv, I think is her name, where they, uh, changed the actor, actress, and everybody, uh, got really mad, it's kind of like that, but, not on the same cultural like scale, obviously. This is quite a relatively unknown film, I'd say. But yeah, anyways, I've been rambling about this stupid issue for so long. Yes, From the Life of the Marionettes, it has a lot of elements of kind of a mystery. Also this erotic undertone, this kind of sexual violence uh, brewing kind of thing, which gives the film a very unnerving edge to it, kind of a tension throughout. Um, we already know the climax. It starts with the murder, and it kind of works its way backwards, which is kind of interesting. Definitely not something that's not been done before, but still something to note. And yeah, so I think it's got a lot of great characters. Could have been better, but... Not a bad film whatsoever. I definitely underrated this one, I think. And yeah, uh, From the Life of the Marionettes, that's that. Alright, The Right. This is a strange one, people. This is a very weird film. Um, I mean, I could show some stills. Uh, I don't know if they're allowed on here, but when when they start doing the ritual at the end of the movie, I mean, <laughs> I was not <laughs> ready for that, bro. I was not ready for that. There's a lot of... This is a very, very cryptic film i would say i feel like even now i don't really fully understand it i i do want to return to this film because i think i'm missing out on something big here i really think there's a lot going on here but i just can't seem to figure it out it's a very elusive occult occultish film as i said before um, starring Ingrid Thulin, Gunnar Bjornstrand, Anders Ek, who was great um, in this. Very cool with his little sunglasses from that clip I just showed. Uh, that was one of the coldest shots in Bergman's films. One of the <laughs> most badass moments. There's kind of an artistic integrity theme going on here. Also, this marital one, kind of a love triangle as well, but kind of a consensual love triangle. It's kind of a strange dynamic that they have with this traveling uh, circus group, you could say. So yeah, um, that's about all I have to say. I think I really have to dig more into this one, but what I've seen is quite good. So yeah, that's the right one.
right, to Joy. Now we're really getting into the meat of this list here. I'm really getting excited about these films. To Joy, one probably my favorite really early Bergman, like pre-50s stuff. Um, I think there's so... I think this is such a beautiful film. The way it concludes with the montage. It's very similar to Summer Interlude. I'd almost say they're mirrors of each other. If you've seen both of them, you'll know what I mean. It's almost as if the films just swap genders, pretty much. And, which is good. I do think Summer Interlude is stronger, as you can clearly tell. But To Joy has so much going for it. It, it, it establishes, also, Bergman's love for music, for classical music. Very prominent here. The way that it all comes together, I think, saves this film in such a beautiful way. The way that he finds happiness in his passion. You know, it's kind of like the old adage of, you know, life goes on type of thing. And when he starts playing his solo that he's been working so hard on, his violin solo, and he gets it right, it's so beautiful. And for such an early Bergman film, this is really impressive. It's just, I can't get enough, you know. Ah, uh, man. But yeah, to joy. Such, wow. Such a great film. Wow. <laughs> All right, coming next, Sarah Band. Um, this is Bergman's final film, and it's quite, it's quite the statement. I do think, I think it's a fitting send-off for Ingmar Bergman. There are a few things I wasn't so into. I did think having kind of this dual plot, uh, kind of stretched them both a little thin. I felt the connection from scenes from a marriage didn't really have that much of an effect on the movie it was pretty much just the first little part and then it was really just there it didn't really explore that relationship that much but I do get that he explored it to death on scenes from a marriage right so I guess it does exp it does kind of talk about other aspects of that um, for instance, Johan's kid, the relationship with his kid that he has, how he's grown very bitter over the years. I have to say, while I was watching this, I was just, despite the, despite not really feeling that it is like a masterpiece or anything like that, I, what I, as I watched it, I was just in awe. It was similar feeling to watching Crisis, his first film, in that I was just so excited to be beginning this journey of watching all of his films and seeing the beginnings. And in the same way, when I watched Saraband, it was that finality, you know, the closing of the curtain, so to speak. Um, it was kind of a proud moment, you know, not that, you know, it takes a lot of effort to watch 39 films, but it was a big, it was a big endeavor, you know, it took a lot of time and wrapping it up with Sarah Band, it just felt like such a fitting, beautiful ending. And I was just watching while being basked in this like glow of, you know, kind of a life flashing before the eyes, you know, it's like a black star. Uh, it's like David Bowie's Black Star, you know, it's the final, the final hurrah, and it's just this beautiful piece of music in the same way that Saraband is just, it ends everything off so gorgeously with that final scene, that callback to Hour of the Wolf, Erland Josephson and Liv Allman, two of the pillars of Ingmar Bergman's films in that final oh my god just gorgeous man the way they lay in bed 
like they did 30 years ago. And that's how Ingmar Bergen's entire career ends. It's just, it, it, it almost brings a tear to the eye. You know what I mean? Like, it's so, it really, this film really makes me emotional for, for more exterior reasons than what it's actually doing in the film, to be honest. But yeah, just such a beautiful film. <laughs> Okay, the magic flute. All right, this is a this is a funny one. Um, it's very different from anything else in Bergman in the collection. This is pretty much a this is a musical, and it's very much stage driven, much like after the rehearsal. But it's less so uh, a blending of of film and theater, and it's more so just filming theater if you know what I mean this is a adaptation of course of Mozart's the magic flute and I would never like seek this out on my own but I'm so glad that it was included in this set because it was such a unique experience and I really really enjoyed it um it was kind of boring in sections you know because it's not really there's not really that much of an emotional impact to watching a Mozart um, watching a Mozart musical you know it's just like it's kind of a novelty in that sense at least for me in this day and age I know for Bergman probably it was life-changing you know but um, this is just not the type of thing that I would seek out but again I enjoy so much that I get to experience this it's like it's like I got to watch The Magic Flute, you know what I mean? And I would never get to do that. The only other, like, classic play that I've seen was The Nutcracker when I was, like, eight. And then this is, like, this is, like, the closest I've been to that experience. And I just think it's so, so cool. And the seat and the set is so great, too. And, and the way it blends kind of it shows like behind the scenes stuff like it shows the audience and it shows like behind the stage a little bit it it has all the you know the set isn't natural you know it's you can tell that it's a stage and that's but I want that you know what I mean it's so cool you know it brings those little elements of cinema those little touches that Bergman adds that makes it so unique, makes it his. And I know classical music is so important to him. And I just think this is so cool that he was even able to make this. I mean, who else could have done this? You know, like you need to get, so, you need to have so much respect from your production company to make something like this. I mean, it's just great. Like there's no way this profited. Like maybe like, I mean, I would be surprised, but yeah, it's just like, it's so cool. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Great, great experience. Mm -hmm. Magician. I have a few problems with the magician. And before I talk about that, I just want to say this is a very, this is a well-made film. It's in that, it's in that golden age of Bergman where he just couldn't miss, where all of his films were just fantastic. These ultra dense, really ponder, uh, ponderous films with, with these dark eye-opening themes, you know, and this is no exception, you know. It stars Max von Sydow in a great role, honestly. He plays the mute magician. This is more one of Bergman's more fantastical works, I would say. It involves potions, magic, 
it's very like uh, medieval fairy tale kind of, but it's also a lie, you know, you can, um, which I find so interesting, you know, it's, it has all these elements, yet it knows that it's, yet it's aware of the fact that it's impossible, you know what I mean? It, all the magicians and whatnot, they're scammers, essentially. And, you know, they're, it's all smoke and mirrors type of thing. But it's, it still has these elements, which gives the film setting so much texture and personality. And that's kind of what I want to get into, what he's saying here. I think it's one of his most, and I don't like to say this because... I think this word is wrongly used as an insult a lot of the time, but it feels like his most pretentious film. So I see this movie's, I see the idea of this movie as one of two things. So either he's talking about, you know, the existence of God, which would be very common for this period of Bergman's cinema. Um, in which case, I feel it's such a non-nuanced, approach that he takes to it and it's very like condescending almost whereas films like the seventh seal winter light you know stuff i'll talk about later i feel like they do this a lot more a lot better with a lot more tact and yeah i just think it he could have approached it with a bit more class i'm not saying i'm not saying he i'm not saying like you have to respect Christianity, but I feel like uh, to make a compelling film, it has to be a little bit more, a little bit more of a gray area. You know what I mean? A little bit more illusion, illusory rather than um, conclusive. A metaphor that I kind of came up with while I was watching it was like a uh, Reddit atheist. Uh, like a fedora type of atheist type of thing and I mean that's just what I felt let me know what you think about that and then the other way I see this going is I didn't really pick up on this but some people I was reading up say that this is Bergman kind of talking about himself as the magician you know people think uh, after the seventh seal people think he's like this sort of magician yet in this film, he's revealing all the behind the scenes, you know, it's just, it's mechanical, you know, it's not, there's nothing mystical about it, really. And in that case, I feel it's a little conceited, honestly. Um, and, you know, all power to him. He's probably worthy of that conceit. Still, I think it's either way that you interpret this film, I just think it's a bit one-sided. And, yeah, but either way, as I've said before, it's still a well-made film. The type of film that I really like, you know, with a lot of, like, very metaphorical, very theme-based rather than narrative-based, which I very much enjoy. So, yeah, uh, that's The Magician, and that's why it's placed here. Let's move on. I stand so long as I know that I'm here and can come at the moment. I can't remember now, Sissi. Elias expects his wife to do her duty. Will you really have that child, Anders? Yes, Lilla. I have to know that. Now, I have to know that. I don't want to know that, but I have to know that. Ooh, okay, Brink of Life. Wow. This is an interesting one. This is essentially... This is very much like Waiting Women, in that it's sort of episodic, not in the same way as Waiting Women, but it does tell mm, three or four separate stories at the same time. Um, so three women are staying in a maternity ward. Eva Dalbeck, Ingrid Thulin, B.B. Anderson. They're all pregnant, and they all have their own issues with that. Like, it's such an incredibly tasteful uh, examination of all the different perspectives that can go into having a child. You know, it's not always this beautiful thing, right? There's a lot of, it can bring a lot of hurt to some people. So that's represented in 
B.B. Anderson's character who doesn't want to have the baby. Um, whereas Eva Dalbeck's character is the complete opposite. She's over the moon to have her child. And and then there's Ingrid Thulin who is kind of on the fence about it. You know, her she has a bit of a tension with her husband, played by a very young Erland Josephson, which I think was very cool to see. And the way that it concludes feels predictable, but it I feel like it had to happen like that. It's so upsetting, but at the same time, very life affirming. And don't even don't even get me started on the performances. This may be, on average, like uh, best acting per capita. Let's say, B.B. Anderson, Ingrid Thulin, Eva Dalbeck. You already know what's going to happen when you get three, these three together. But they literally went above and beyond in this in this film. I think Eva Dalbeck won the uh, award, the Best Actress at Cannes. And yeah, she deserved it. The, all three of them deserved it. Like, this is mind-blowing. This is really great acting in this film. Really good. Really good. Um... So yeah, all three of them did such an amazing job. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, Brink of Life. Definitely give this one a shot. A bit of a lesser known Bergman, but I think it's super important. Yeah, really great work. Yeah. Finally, I get to talk about Dreams. I've been looking forward to this one because I personally think this is Bergman's most underrated film. When I was looking at this film online, I mean, every comment was just like shitting on this film. I didn't really understand why. But yeah, let, let me just get into the film itself. So it's it stars Eva Dalbeck and Harriet Anderson. It's one of Bergman's more sensual films, kind of in a exploitative way like summer with monica but i would say it's more it's more tasteful than that film all the uh nudity and whatnot not that there's much not that there's much nudity but uh it's very suggestive but anyways yeah so they go to this village gothenburg to do this modeling shoot and they're both, they both have these, both characters have this little romantic fling thing going on. Marianne with a married man. And the one that I found most compelling was with Doris and Gunnar Bjornstrand's character, uh, who is an, kind of an older, rich man. They kind of meet up by chance, and it reminds me a lot of Ikiru um their relationship not that they really share any of the same themes but their relationship between them uh the old man wanting to feel kind of leech off the youth of the young girl uh i just it's it on it it made me very sad honestly the aging gunner bjorn strand trying to keep up with her youthful vigor you know and ultimately failing we learn about the old man and the relationship he has with his daughter and how he's trying to re essentially replace the severed relationship with this young girl harriet anderson sure it's not his most exciting most uh inventive film but i, I think it's a very beautiful film and i think more people should give it a shot. But yeah, that's streams, and I highly recommend it. Next is The Silence, the third film in Bergman's Faith Trilogy. I would say this is the weakest one in the trilogy, but not by not not by an incredible margin. This film is very understated, uh, not in the 
and I mean that not in the discourse about the film, but the film itself is understated in the way that the characters interact with each other. They don't really express all that they want to, and that creates a unspoken tension, especially between Ingrid Thulin and Gunnel Lindbal Gunnel Lindbalm's characters. Uh, there's not a lot of dialogue, obviously, in this film, and that is, of course, intentionally playing off of the title, The Silence, right? In some ways, I think that could have come off a little gimmicky if it was done differently, but I don't think it's as silent as people make it out to be. It's a pretty normal amount of talking. It's not like... It's it's like a kind of like a Bellatar amount of talking, you know, there's very long sections where people just walk around, do nothing, and then they have like a conversation. But it's not like I wouldn't call it like a quasi silent film like some people were kind of making it out to be when I was looking into this. But, so yeah, for that reason, I don't think it's like, I don't think the gimmick, I, I don't think it comes off as gimmicky because it feels like a pretty normal amount of talking. He's not just like doing it for the effect, if you know what I mean. But yeah, there's also in this film, Bergman likes to do this thing where there's like a political conflict but it never gets explained it's a backdrop so like i'm thinking shame and the silence especially uh we watch as they ride on a train to some unknown european country as tanks roll by we don't know to where but it just adds this it adds this extra influence on the film you know it's a uh, it's a whole nother layer to dig into it plays the tension mirrors the tension in their relationship or perhaps it even trivializes it and then there's also the the issue of the child being involved in this a very uh almost mystical film a lot of like vision like things happen you don't really know if it's an imagination or not like the with the uh, small people and the uh, butler the butler kind of reminds me of um the bar the bartender in uh, the shining not that uh, these films have anything to do with each other but just that like friendly <laughs> And they're not really the same, but this, like, friendly vision guy that, like, guides you, you know, maybe in The Shining, he guides you towards something not so good, but, but, um, yeah, he kind of makes a friend with this butler, and I, I mean, I think the butler is real because he comes, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that the butler is real, but to him, he feels like a spirit guide kind of character I, what am i saying i don't know but anyways let's let's just move on the silence great film All right, uh, for a document, the first one, bet you weren't expecting it this high, but yes, this for a document filled me with so many emotions that I didn't think I would feel watching a barely an hour documentary about an island. It's very much like the 1979 version, it, it's goes it does interviews and watches from afar as this farming community goes about their lives which 
some may call it mundane, yes, but I mean, to them, this is, you know, their life, right? And maybe it's the length, but I think this one just hits so much harder for me. First of all, why is the lady, why is the first farmer girl just like spitting some of the most prophetic philosophy you've ever heard? Like, like, did she get a script? And then the motif of the goats are, the, or was it the sheep? The sheep, the motif of the sheep, I found so compelling. And I know it's, it sounds strange, but these sheep to me represent life for these farmers. You know, this is like agriculture is their lifeline essentially. And seeing the, the death of, the slaughter of the sheep and then the rebirth of the sheep as they walk around in the field it gave me it reminded me a lot of my favorite movie Andrei Rublev where Tarkovsky uses horses in a very same in the very same manner horses in that film act as a symbol of life a symbol of faith and they both they remind me of each other what Bergman did with the sheep. Wow, yeah. Um, maybe I'm looking into it too much, but I just thought I, I was honestly blown away by the depth that this had that I was not expecting at all. Sonata. And this may be a little bit high of a placement for some people. I know this is a very highly regarded film, and I respect that. I do like the collaboration between Ingrid Bergman and Ingmar Bergman. It's like LeBron and Kobe were like on different teams for their whole lives, which, you know, they were. But then, uh, like, late in their career, they're just like, let's have one season together on the same team. And they, they just balled up one last, like, one last time. You know, this mutual respect thing coming from different conferences, coming together for one last season, you know. Kind of, <laughs> kind of maybe not the best analogy, but it's pretty cool uh, to see them both together. But yeah, Autumn Sonata, quite a, it's much like Scenes from a Marriage. This is a relationship study in many ways and a very deep one at that what i find most what i find most interesting about this film is that is the way that everything is feels suggested i wrote something down the other day about this movie you know how people say uh, show don't tell in writing well in this film it's like you don't even see it it's just, you kind of just know through body language what's going on behind the scenes, which I find is a testament to the acting of both Liv Allman and Ingrid Bergman. I mean, no kidding, right? I mean, these are some top level performances by these two actresses uh, in this film. Some of the most, like delicate, nuanced performances. Like, oh my, oh, it's so, like you just see everything through through the eyes in that piano scene. You can see everything in, in Liv Ullman's eyes. It's so incredible. Like, I'm almost gonna like tear up. Like it's, ah, oh, parental relationships, nothing new for Bergman, but so deeply developed in this film. And the tension that you feel throughout the film, you know, it feels all fine at first and then it snowballs into this final climax between the two and then, oh my goodness, you know, spoilers, okay, for the next five seconds, but when Helena crawls out on her hands and knees while they're fighting, like, that was, I... 
that just stopped me in my tracks. Like I, yeah, wow. Autumn Sonata, even just talking about it, it makes me want to revisit this film. I think it'll place very similarly, but I do want to, I do want to dig deeper into this film because wow, there's, it's, whew, it's a good one. Autumn Sonata. Oh, Scenes from a marriage. One of Bergman's most renowned pieces of art. This is a sprawling five-hour miniseries, I would call it. Um, I, I, of course, watched the TV version of both this and Fanny and Alexander. I mean, according to everybody, they're the far superior versions. So yeah, I watched all five hours of it. And let me say, it did not feel like five hours. I, this thing flew by. For being just like a relationship drama, which is not usually my thing, the it was so engaging the whole time uh like it was like every episode i just wanted to keep going it was like 4 a.m and i was like nah i gotta i was like one more episode one more episode i watched like three episodes in one night and then i woke up and finished it in the morning not the healthiest uh sleep scenario of my life but uh I, you know I, i've i've been through worse <sighs> but yeah Let's get into the film itself. This is one of the most detailed relationship studies I've ever seen in film. I mean, every little thing about these two people is put on display in such an honest and open way. You know, it's not cheesy like a lot of dramas like this can be. None of the issues that arise in this movie ever really have a neat kind of bow tie conclusion to them. It's a very me it's very messy and it shows the messiness of relationships and marriage and everything about it, you know? And yeah, it's like a cross section of human relationship. Really masterful piece of work. The only reason I probably put it a little lower than others is just Thematically, it's not what I seek. And so, yeah, I mean, I've never been married, obviously. So I'm not that... I'm not that well-versed on that kind of thing. But, obvi but I still marvel at this, at this uh, work. So, yeah, scenes from a marriage. with Monica. This is probably Bergman's most youthful film and probably his sexiest film as well. Uh, <laughs> those things don't really go that well together when you uh, say it like that, but uh, <laughs> if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, uh, it got I know it got a lot of attention back in the day. Um, when it came out for its sexual content, um, there was like a English dub that they played in like Hollywood theaters <laughs> because it was like this like sexy girl, you know, it's like, I don't know, kind of, kind of a strange bastardi bastardization. It, there's... A lot more to it than just a hot girl you know what I mean it's just it's kind of uh, funny that that's what they take from it seeing as this is quite a complex film when you really get down to it this is a film about young love young love is what I'm the word I was looking for and how it kind of feels like it feels like paradise in the time if you really think about it it's quite a depressing look at 
young love and that whole concept. They meet, they're unhappy with their jobs, they find each other, they fall in love, they go away, they run away from society in this guy's boat, and then eventually, you know, they start to realize you can't live on the run forever, you know, you can't hide from problems. They find this out the hard way when they kind of go back and they try and continue this love that they felt in the summer and it doesn't feel the same, you know, it and it ends in in animosity. And yeah, um Summer with Monica. It's more it's more than just a hot girl, guys. Right behind Summer with Monica is going to be, yes, Summer Interlude. And I know some of you guys are saying, How? How can you put Summer Interlude ahead of Summer with Monica? Hey, I hear you. That's me, man. That's, that's just me. The reason I enjoyed Summer Interlude more, I think, is for some of the following reasons. Okay. So for one... I don't know how much, how big of a difference this makes, but I like, I find it more relatable and more summer-like. I think it plays more into the, uh, the, uh, the idea of summer is short, cause, um, especially in Sweden where summer is like, like one to two months of like heat and then it's like super dark and cold. So that, I think... Summer Interlude plays on that a lot better because they meet during summer, like when they're on vacation rather than like on land and then leaving. And I know that doesn't seem like a big difference, but I feel like a lot of people have had either like um, a relationship or a friend they meet at like summer camp or vacation i mean i used to go to summer camp all the time and i would meet dudes and i'd be like yeah uh yeah we should hang out bro we we should be friends man and then literally never talk to them again and it's kind of like this so i find it a little more uh relatable on that level i also think uh maj brit nilsson and burger malmston have a lot of chemistry together they have a they make a good duo in this film mash britt nielsen as i mentioned before heavily underrated uh bergman actress um she essentially she got replaced by harry anderson and you know that's fair play but i think but i kind of wished i saw her in a few more films before uh before taking off to do other projects um but yeah much like Summer with Monica, this is a very, and I've been reserving this word for this film, it's a very effervescent film. Uh, probably his most effervescent. It's this beautiful summer fling, this youthful lightness, and then contrasted by the reality in the present tense of this crushing darkness. And if you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. The way it concludes is just so beautiful to me. Um, remember how I said this is kind of a companion, kind of a mirror image to to Joy from 1950, um, in the way that the uh, characters are the swapped they swap genders on the on the main characters, and that's exactly right. So in the ending. Instead of this music piece, she does this complicated dance routine. And the final image of the ballerinas completing this beautiful performance just... It does the exact same thing as To Joy. I do enjoy this film more than To Joy, but they're doing pretty much the exact same thing. It's life goes on type of thing. You could look at it as passion is more so a sedative for the for the pain uh, that she feels so yeah um 
Summer Interlude, I think, is really great. It would make a great double feature with Summer of Monica. Do that. All right, coming up next is Sawdust and Tinsel. And I like this film for many reasons. This is a very, this is quite an early career film, 1953. And I think this is one of Bergman's first heavily subtextual films. And what I mean by that is, of course, you know, other films have, uh, you know, there's things to think about, right? But I think this is his first film where a lot of the meaning is latent. It's not exactly baked into the film itself, or the narrative, I should say. And I really like the symbolism of the circus performers and the setting of the circus. The character played by Anders Eck, one of his most... One of the most memorable characters, I would say, in terms of um, his style. Um, Frost was his name, the, the guy with the blush on his face. This is also the first film that Bergman made with, um, with Sven Nyquist as cinematographer. I do notice the difference quite a bit. I do think the film looks better. It's more my style of cinematography. I feel like Sven's, I feel like Sven Nyquist's style is more abstract, whereas Gunnar Fischer, who did it before, his style is more formalist. I mean, Gunnar Fischer has some great films under his belt, uh, cinematography-wise. Wild Strawberries, Seventh Seal, uh, Summer of Monica that we just talked about. I just, I can't deny that I enjoy. Sven Nyquist's style more than Gunnar Fischer. But yeah, I think Sawdust and Tinsel is a very interesting, thought-provoking film. If you're into this type of Bergman, um, kind of reminds me of The Seventh Seal slightly in its setting, uh, or in The Magician as well, um, in their almost medieval setting, or at least, you know, somewhat in the past. Um, then I would definitely check this out. Sawdust and Tinsel, 1953. You don't know, Now, Hour of the Wolf coming up here. And this film, this film is without a doubt, Bergman's most horror-inspired film. So yeah, I really like that change of style. I kind of draw parallels with Sawdust and Tinsel in the way that Max von Sydow's character at the end is, if you've seen it, humiliated in a very, um, in a very brutal way. Even more so than Sawdust and Tinsel, I think the humiliation feels even more cruel. It kind of talks about how memories and past experiences are held against people. And I think that's kind of demonstrated in that scene that I showed where... They all stand around and watch him in his most vulnerable, weak moment and laugh at him. And then, yeah, the horror elements are also great. Yeah, I think Hour of the Wolf is definitely a essential Bergman film. Through a Glass Darkly. And this film, for me, I think needs a rewatch. Because, honestly, and I, I regret to inform you, I feel like a clown on display, but I 
missed a little bit of it because I, my eyes were fluttering with a little bit of that, a little bit of that tiredness, right? And I may have fallen asleep for the middle portion of this film. And for that, I truly apologize. So, but I got a lot, but I got a lot of it. Okay, I know what happens, all right? I, I mean, with that being said, this being number 12 is pretty good. Uh, let's, let's just, let's just say that. I mean, let's just talk about what I know, okay? This is probably one of Bergman's bleakest films. It talks of suicide, incest, and the famous metaphor of that Bergman presents as of God as a spider. That that line where Harriet Anderson and Harriet Anderson insane performance with her portrayal as the schizophrenic Karen. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, also mental illness. <laughs> yeah, this film is not a happy film. Uh, one of his most depressing, I would say. And that's always, that's all, you always want a little depressing in your, uh, in your film, don't you? But yeah, the line in where she declares after her mental episode, you could say, that she has seen God and he is a spider, is one of the most striking lines and metaphors in Bergman's filmography. I think it's one of his most frightening, but also compelling arguments against God. Because you could, a lot of people say that Bergman is an atheist, and I think it's fair to say that he goes back and forth. In this film, he seems to believe in a God, but is spiteful towards him. And isn't that all the more frightening to think that there is a God, but he hates us? Anyways, that's about all I have to say about Through a Glass Darkly. Yeah, one of... Not an easy watch, I would say. Uh, not easy at all. Closing in on the top 10, we have Smiles of a Summer Night. This is one that I didn't really expect to enjoy nearly as much as I did. And that's mainly because I'm usually drawn to more... Um, this sounds pretentious, but serious films, you know, uh, this is marketed as a comedy, um, which I usually kind of reject and, you know, don't, I know that's, that's just how I am. Okay. I think there's so much more to this than just a fun comedy. Sure. It, it is mo one of Bergman's most playful films and it is pretty funny in certain moments. Even so, I think this film is so poetic and beautiful. Its characters are memorable and interesting. I mean, uh, Gunnar Bjornstrand's character, how he's always talking about his young wife. Um, uh, the character uh, played by Jarl Kuhl, who I've talked about before is like the king of funny characters in Bergman films. Uh, his character, you know, he's like um, the line where he says, uh, "You can, you can touch, you can touch my wife all you want, but if you touch my mistress, I turn into a tiger." That's one of that's one of Bergman's like funniest one-liners, honestly. Uh, who else? Who else is in this film? Harry Anderson playing the kind of loose, well, uh, I don't want to say loose, but kind of uh, teasy uh, maid. And it's just such a fun concept, too. The idea of these different couples, and they all kind of swap, they all realize they're kind of in the wrong 
relationship. Yeah, it's just such a lovely film. And the way, and the just the, oh, just the ending. It just closes it in so nicely, ties it with a beautiful bow. Such a perfect film, honestly. I just absolutely love it. So yeah, that's smile, Smiles of a Summer Night. Beautiful. Not nearly as cheerful as Smile as a Summer Night. This is going to be Passion of Anna. This is much like Hour of the Wolf and Shame, who, which are kind of a pseudo trilogy, I would say. Uh, I've heard that described before as kind of a trilogy in that all three have Max von Sydow and Liv Allman as a couple and then something terrible happens to them. So, whatever, what was I saying? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's very dark, like those other films. This is uh, one of the early color films from Bergman. 69, pretty late into the color game. Bergman was not, was definitely not bad at using color. He was just, he just prefers black and white, and... I th honestly, I think black and white is probably better, but the, what uh, this is a whole other argument. I don't know what I'm talking about. Passion of Anna. Okay. Passion of Anna is great because it has a lot of those sinister elements like Hour of the Wolf. It's not as horror-y, but it is very, it's very uneasy, like, like I said with Hour of the Wolf. That first time that you see the dog, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, that immediately hooked me into the film. I was like, okay, now we're locked in. Jeez, okay, this is gonna be this is gonna be one of those. Okay. Yeah, um whew, not a pretty sight. A lot of brutal, brutal violence in this film. Well, you don't get to see the violence, but the aftermath of the violence. He kind of does this experimental thing, which I'm not sure if I'm really fully on board with, but he kind of, he takes the actors out of character and he does like interviews mid movie about what they think about their character, which is like, I don't know if it fully worked. I, like, I don't know what really the point was, but I do like the experimentation. And then, oh my god, the dream sequence where it goes into black and white. Oh my god. I I I wanted to show that as the I wanted to show that as the featured clip, but I thought you need to see that for yourself. That oh mm, my life. This film is incredible. This film is amazing. Oh my god. Okay. It might even be better than number 8, but it's too late now. Uh, oh man. Okay. Yeah. Passion of Anna is an absolute stunning film. Wow. All right. Coming next is going to be the Virgin Spring. It was adapted from a medieval play, if I'm not mistaken, and you can feel you can definitely feel that in the film itself. It feels much like a parable. It also asks the question, as Bergman often does, if God is real, why does he allow such terrible things to happen? You know, I can't really decide if this is anti-God or more of a Christian film that Bergman is making here because Max von Sydow's character retains his faith even through the horrible events that transpire. It also features one of my absolute favorite shots, maybe ever, where 
Max von Sydow goes outside and bends the 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 tree. I don't even know. I don't even know what I want to say about it. It just feels like it's something that you have to let wash over you. You know, it's something that you have to experience for yourself. I think one of those faith films from Bergman that just absolutely leaves you stunned, crushed, just devastated, and I love it. Plötsligt började vi skrattande springa mot den gamla gungan som vi inte besökt sen barndomen. Vi satt oss i den som tre små snälla systrar. Och Anna gungade oss långsamt och makligt. All verk var borta. Det människor jag håller mest av i världen var hos mig. It looks like we're on a streak of absolutely brutally depressing films and this is gonna be cries and whispers <laughs> this is hard this is a hard hard watch and that's mostly due to harriet anderson's portrayal of a person dying of cancer and her pain is not subtle it is not silent she is very vocal and that's the hard part. And her family's indifference, or not, not so much indifference, but kind of like fake caring about her illness. There's also the motif of red running throughout this film, which I found interesting. I haven't fully decided what I think about that, uh, what it means, I mean, to say. But I think it's one of Bergman's best uses of color. I also wanted to make a connection between this and The Sacrifice from Andrei Tarkovsky. I'm going to show two shots, and you tell me if you can see the semblance. I saw this shot immediately, and I thought of The Sacrifice. And I just think that's so cool, you know? I love, I love, I love seeing connections like that in film. That's one of the joys of film for me. But yeah, just uh, I just thought I'd mention that. And oh my, Harriet Anderson. It was about a ten-year hiatus from Bergman films, and then she comes back and does this. Like, <gasps> Harriet Anderson might be the goat. She might be the goat. Through the glass, darkly. Smiles of the summer. Summer with Monica. Cries and whispers. She's the goat. Wow, she is so good. She is so good. Like, oh my god, I can't. Oh, wow. Wow, okay. Cries and whispers. What else is there to say? Oh. Hoo-hoo. Next is going to be Shame at number six. And this one actually took some time to grow on me. I watched it and I gave it kind of, I gave it a bit of a lower score around 15 or so. But I just can't stop thinking about this film. There's so many images in it that just uh, stick with me. The shot that I showed of them standing there as their house is on fire. The final shot on the boat in that foggy nowhere sea. And then just all the beautiful sequences, not beautiful, but terrifying sequences of war. I mean, this is Bergman's most war film. He has hinted at war themes throughout his filmography, most notably in The Silence. And similarly in Shame, there's a war going on. It's much more in your face. We can see the violence going on. The planes rolling by, shooting down stuff, blowing stuff up, bombs going off. But we don't know what war this is. We don't know who's fighting. <laughs> it's just that... Oh my god. What a stunning critique. The conflict in the film feels dystopian where people just sort of persecute you 
no matter what you do. The the injustice, it really, it, it gets under your skin, you know? Ooh, wow. I'm just thinking about Gunnar Bjornstrand's character. God, this film is so good. Like... <sighs> love it, love it. Shame, 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 shame. Number five is going to be The Seventh Seal, the quintessential art house film. It certainly deserves the respect that it has, the renown that it has gained throughout film history. The Seventh Seal just gets everything right. The cast, unmatched. B.B. Anderson, Max von Sydow, in his, one of his first roles, Gunnar Bjornstrand as the sidekick. Not that it's like a superhero movie, but it's just one of those essential films, you know? One of the most iconic moments, the game of chess with death, the line that Max von Sydow says, we make an idol out of our fear and we call it God. One of the most hard-hitting quotes that he has ever put to film. And to think that this was such a change from everything before. I mean, the closest you could say, like I said before, would be Sawdust and Tinsel from 1953, but everything else is incomparable to The Seventh Seal. It's such a landmark moment in cinema. He makes Smiles of a Summer Night. They allow him to make whatever he wants, basically, after that. And he pulls out The Seventh Seal seal i don't want to think about alternate timelines but do you think he could have made even more films like this if they gave him the budget earlier like what a transition the seventh seal and then we're gonna talk about this soon immediately after wild strawberries the same year he said not one masterpiece we make it two we make it two in one year okay bergman slow down bro like, uh, that's unheard of, man. That's unheard of. Except for maybe Hitchcock. This belongs in, like, the strat upper stratosphere of film history. Insane film. Insanely... Ah, I love that. strawberries 1957 same year as the seventh seal these two are basically interchangeable for me let's call it a tie but wild strawberry is right now is slightly getting the edge first off the performance by victor Sjostrom. this man was 78 years old when he starred in wild strawberries and he did this good of a job he is I, I, a lot of people have their opinions about auteur theory, but Victor Sjostrom is the auteur of this film. But apart from his performance, what's really happening in this film, this is a film of facing death. It's a film about regret. All these people celebrate his life, but the people he cares about most don't like him. It's kind of the question of, is it better to pursue personal goals or foster relationships with the people you love most which provides more satisfaction at the end of your life the way that bergman plays with generational differences i read this on a review so i didn't make this up but when they're driving in the car there's like a tiered system so in the front there's isaac right another seat back there's the middle-aged couple. In the very back, there's the three teenagers. Cycling back to the front of the car, then there's Ingrid Thulin's character, who is pregnant. So, in a sense, representing a baby. 
like uh, the symbol of purity and rebirth. Baby, dying old man, middle age, teenagers. Very thought provoking. Not much more to say. Wild strawberries, absolute masterpiece. What hope be brutal bugger? in on the top three these are the cream of the cream if you know what i'm saying fanny and alexander part of me feels like i should like this less than i do but i can't help but love it it feels very much like one of bergman's most narrative based films one of his more like straightforward stories yet it's so perfectly crafted that I just can't fault anything that this film does. First thing I noticed in terms of scene composition, shot composition, this may be one of the greatest films ever made. Every shot is so detailed and meticulous, especially early on. Everything feels so ornate. And then the contrast with when they go to the priest's house, the grayness, feeling of isolation it's so well translated through shot composition and then second of all the care the characters it's so you care so deeply for these kids it's such a beautiful story of family to me this feels like the ceremonial final film yeah i know he made quite a few films after this, but there's such a finality that I find to this film. It feels like a culmination. We see Erland Josephson, we see Harry Anderson, both in quite late stages in their career. Uh, Gunnar Bjornstrand with the minor role, full white beard. It's like a, it feels like a final send off for these legendary actors that have been with Bergman for so long. This is one of the few Bergman films that genuinely brought a tear to my eye. For the five hours, much like Scenes from a Marriage, it goes by easily. I mean, I could have watched this in one sitting if I wanted to. I feel like this is one of Bergman's most accessible works as well. I think you could show this to pretty much anybody and they would love it. It's such a universal story. Not, uh, <laughs> I mean, not everybody's been imprisoned in a house, but, uh, but yeah. Seeing the world through the eyes of Fanny and Alexander, these children, I don't know why Bergman didn't do it sooner, you know? This is a unequivocal masterpiece. Uh, that's Fanny and Alexander. And number two, with much deliberation, is going to be Persona. I thought about this for a long time. I believe wholeheartedly this is Bergman's magnum opus. It is his most unique, most indelible statement in his filmography. And yet my number one slightly edges it out. And that is up to taste. But let's talk about the good of Persona. Persona, like I said is an incredibly unique film. It is one of those early works of film poetry, true film poetry. I feel like that word is heavily overused in today's day and age, but this is a prime example. Him and Tarkovsky both made Persona and Andrei Rublev in the same year, which may make 1966 the best year of all time. Persona is a latent film. It's a difficult film to understand, and nobody can really truly understand it. But 
here's what I kind of get out of it. This is a film for me about connections. It's also a film about the way that we hide our true selves. The doctor makes a comment that Liv Allman's character is mute because she's tired of playing a character. And if we take that into account, I think it makes the rest of the film a lot easier to understand. And yet, there's so much more going on. Theme layering is something that I find to be uh, similar between the absolute master directors. I feel like I'm kind of uh, meat riding a little bit, but Andre Tarkovsky, obviously, very similar to Bergman in the way that in this film he layers meaning so heavily. And that's the beauty of poetry. And not just in meaning, but in form as well. Never before had Bergman strayed so far from the known conventions of film. The scene that comes to mind uh, primarily is the one where Liv Allman has a does a, like a whole monologue. It's like a five minute monologue, and then BB Anderson does the same monologue, and they shoot it from different perspectives. Who else would think to do that? I definitely see the influence of the decade. The 60s was obviously such a momentous time in film. One of the greatest films ever made. And when I say that, I really mean it, okay? I don't throw that around, all right? But yeah, Persona, 1966. Number one of 39 films, Winterlight. When I truly listen to myself, it just becomes so clear that this is my favorite Bergman film. It has all the themes that I am interested in, and it delivers it in such a analytical, it almost feels like a essay. When people say about uh, media and stuff like that, every line could be an essay. This is one of the films where it truly applies, in my opinion. This film is so dense with meaning, such meaty dialogue, it's hard to keep up, honestly, and it requires multiple watches. I believe this is Bergman's most striking, most cutting critiques of God himself. Tomas, the priest, played by Gunnar Bjornstrand, as he essentially lets down everybody in his life. And he also fails God himself. He loses his faith. This film, again, references the spider, the God as a spider, that was explored so interestingly in Through a Glass Darkly. Uh, Max von Sydow's character, his fear is mainly in uh, China, I think China for him is more so symbolic of this idea of an unknown evil. He doesn't really know what he's afraid of. There's so much that I could say about this film. I've written like pages of notes about this film. And apart from what it says, I think this is going to be Orange Trans best best role. Of course, it's shot extremely well, Sven Nyquist, especially in the way that he portrays the coldness through his cinematography. I think this is one of the best films about God, about faith, about Christianity. Winterlight, despite my love for Persona, is my favorite Bergman film and is going to be number one on my list. So thank you. So yeah, we finally come to the end of the list. I hope you enjoyed. I hope nobody's got, I, I hope nobody's too upset with my placements. 
If you made it this far, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And yeah, there's sure to be more lists like this coming in the future. Eventually, I want to do a Kurosawa list. Uh, I'm also going to do a 60s album list very soon. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, lots more stuff coming in the future. I hope you enjoyed once again, and I'll see you later. Thank you very much.